to join. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? We cannot hear you. Uh oh. You're not uh, hearing Zach. You can hear him. He said something. Let's see. Yeah, I, I am chatting away here. Uh, the microphone, microphone is. Uh, your mic is working. I know he was you. Yeah, I just see him. Uh, he turn up his volume. He might be. Okay. You're not muted, are you, Zach? Nope, not muted. Okay. You might want to change the speakers. Sorry. Yeah, let's see here. Mm, little audio for the speaker. Now. I thought I heard you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, ah. sure. but we no. want him coming to the room. Okay. Hold, please. <laughs> the room is wired just to him. He says something we can throw. We can test. You're coming through a small. Sure. Microphone speaker. We want to get you through the classroom, Bill Jim. Yes, yes. Let's make it hot. Let's make it loud and fun, and give it. Oh yeah. We get some uh, some like stadium reverb on there. A little a little pre delay. The speaker. Okay. No. Here maybe. Yes. Which one was that? Uh, that mm -hmm. There we go. You guys hear me all right? Oh, yeah. yes. yes, we got you. Excellent. Hey, miracles. Oh, we got you with an echo. The Luddites were wrong. Can you talk to him again? Can I what? Talk to him. Talk to him. I can talk. You want to hear him talk again? <laughs> sure, I can, I can chat with you guys. How many students are there in this class? There are 51 students enrolled in this class. Whoa. Yeah. So you're getting a partial view here. I'll spin the Look at that. camera around. So we're still waiting. It's a little bit early, but we'll. Everybody is afraid of sitting in the middle? Uh, that's, that's, it does. Uh, that's, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm judging you guys, but. I am judging you guys a little bit. <laughs> rocking. We're rocking. Right. Everything is good. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, we can we can get going. So thank you very much to Zach Moore for joining us today. We enjoyed reading the introduction, the first chapter and the other readings that you recommended. And we get to read two more chapters from your book for next week because Professor Galbraith has chosen chapter 14 and 15 from Zach's book to be part of next week's reading. So we get to keep reading, that's a good thing. So um, I did some foundation, but I think that I managed to avoid stepping on your toes. And I don't think there's gonna be real duplication with what you're about to bring to us. So I'm gonna just say thank you so much and turn it over to Zach. You leave if you can, 15 or so minutes at the end, 15, 20 at the end, and we'll do some Q and A with you. Sound okay? Okay. okay. Yeah, I, was, I was really only planning to talk for 15 or ah, 20 and, and let it go as, as far as folks wanna go. Do you want to share your screen or are you just gonna talk? I'm just gonna talk, I, I, all of these fancy, Okay. Fancy accoutrements are too modern for me. Okay, off you go. <laughs> all right. Well, thank all of you for uh, taking this class and attending this lecture. And uh, for those of you who did the readings, thank you for doing the readings, uh, especially the stuff from my book. Um, what I like most about the structure of Professor Kelton's class here is the fact that she's invited me to speak with you. But number two on the list of its virtues, I think, is its emphasis on the diversity of thought surrounding economic theory. Um, in the second half of the 20th century, the Cold War kind of flattened all of the intellectual vibrancy and variety of the previous two centuries of economic thought into what I think is a pretty silly binary. 
where you had American capitalists on one side and Soviet communists on the other. And swearing fealty to one or the other became not just a test of political loyalty, but a really common and I think pretty bankrupt way of sorting and understanding the past. So the three thinkers that I assigned to you for today um, don't fit cleanly into contemporary ideological categories. And over the course of the 20th century, um, I think they could have been resorted into either the capitalist or the socialist camp, depending on which aspects of their thought you wanted to focus on. Um, two of them I don't think are particularly famous. Had anybody heard of Norman Engel before? Anybody? It's okay. I had never heard of the guy until I started doing research for my Keynes book. Um, but he was really influential during his, his time. Uh, he was born in the 1870s and covered the Dreyfus case in France for British newspapers and this big anti-Semitic terrible thing that happened in France. Uh, most of the journalists who covered that ended up becoming sort of famous humanitarians. Um, and at the turn of the century, he published this kind of turgid treatise that I assigned to you. Um, I think the writing was better at the time, but holding it up next to somebody like Keynes, who was writing at the same time, it's clear he's just a little more dry. Um, but as folks from the turn of the 20th century go, I think in general, Engels holds up pretty well um, by 21st century uh, kind of moral standards. He argued that war was stupid and irrational. He helped found an international alliance against fascism when that sort of thing was really controversial. Um, he was very nearly a pacifist in his foreign policy outlook, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1933. Then when World War II came around, he became a really fulsome advocate of military action against Hitler and Mussolini, and spent most of the 30s imploring FDR and the American public to go to war in defense of the world's democracies. So the book I assigned you is called The Great Illusion. It's his most famous work. Uh, it was published in Britain in 1909 and became an international sensation when it was published in the US a year later. Uh, it defined his career uh, and continued to be republished for decades after its initial release, which at the time was a pretty big deal. Uh, it wasn't like today where you could just Google and find PDFs of things on the internet. Uh, having your book in print for two decades, especially a dry treatise on like the causes of war uh, is really quite an achievement even though today he's all but forgotten. Uh, at, at the time, he inspired uh, not just you know, readers to go out and buy his book, but these, there were Norman Engel clubs, uh, they're almost like cults where people would show up and uh, just talk to each other about how irrational and stupid war was and celebrate the, uh, you know, the golden age of human freedom that had, had come upon them. But today he's totally gone. Um, no one really remembers him. Um, I didn't assign the entire book because it's really dry and kind of boring. And I think the argument can really be summed up in a couple of sentences. Um, he basically believed there was nothing to be gained from military force. Any resources that one country obtained through conquest uh, could be enjoyed through trade without all of this destructive bloodshed and misery. Um, I think the argument was wrong in some important respects, which we can talk about later, but it was a really great fit for the times. The turn of the century, was a golden age for the intellectual class in Europe and America, or at least they remembered it as a golden age once it was over. And the best material from this period has a kind of progressive optimism to it. Um, everybody believes that we've turned a page on a terrible past and have entered a glorious new future. Uh, it's not quite the sort of like end of history theorizing that you see in the end of the 20th century, but it's pretty close. Um, and all of this gets completely wrecked by, by World War I. But in 1909 and 1910, this is a really, really compelling argument. Uh, and one of the reasons it's compelling is because it's not exactly new. Um, Engel is kind of revising an idea that I, first appears, at least in manuscripts that are still around, um, from an 18th century thinker named the Baron de Montesquieu Charles de Secondat. And most people just call him Montesquieu today. He's one of the first capital L liberal thinkers uh, from the age of, people call this like classical liberalism, but I don't like that term for a bunch of other reasons, which we can talk about later. Um, but Montesquieu had a sort of gendered idea of war and peace. And he thought men were really violent and aggressive and women were kind of vain and decorous. 
and commerce would would feminize society and make people more materialistic, want to decorate themselves, and uh, they wouldn't want to lose these nice decorations they'd acquired through commerce uh, through war. And so by feminizing society, you would improve it and make it less warlike. So the idea was to promote commerce. The, the word capitalism at this point in time didn't really exist, um, but by the 19th century it did, and a lot of other thinkers like uh, the utilitarian philosophers, James Mill and John Stuart Mill, um, took up a lot, a lot of the ideas that Montesquieu had worked with a century earlier. And so by the time we get to Engel, there's quite a pedigree for this idea. And even though most people hadn't read all of these works, the ideas are reflected in society, or at least in the kind of upper crust intellectual components of society. And I think to some extent, you know, this idea is still with us today, that the basic aim of Joe Biden's Build Back Better agenda, for instance, um, it was to diffuse the sort of ugliness and fanaticism of American politics with some shared economic prosperity. If everybody is financially taken care of in some in some way, they're less prone to conflict. Um, there's still some intuitive appeal to this idea, even though people have been advancing it for hundreds of years and we still have wars. Um, and I think that's one of the important lessons about the history of capitalism is like these ideas keep coming uh, and being revised, but there's a certain set of, of intuitions that, that seem to last no matter what, <laughs> what, what history serves up. Um, so for Engel, the important thing is that capitalism, um, or what we would call capitalism today, um, was a system that was designed to put an end to violence and repression. The point of capitalism was to create all of this wealth and interdependent wealth, particularly through free trade, um, that would be jeopardized by violence and make violence irrational. Um, and we, you certainly hear that when you talk about, when people talk about free trade today. So that these arguments are reflected when the WTO was created in 1995 and things like that. And again, I think there's, there's a certain intuitive appeal to the idea, uh, however naive and utopian it, it may, may seem. Um, how does Engel fit with John Strachey? Had, had any of you heard of John Strachey before? Okay, also somebody who was really influential in his own time, but who has been all but forgotten a, a little bit later than, than Engel. Um, you know, by 1932, when he wrote the book that, um, that I assigned to you, you know, we'd had World War I, we had the Great Depression. There have been some pretty hard lessons for the world um, since Engel. And there's a more pessimistic kind of tone to society in general, but Strachey is not just like a more pessimistic Angle, he's arguing the exact opposite of what Angle is arguing. He's defending communism by arguing that capitalism is a system of violence and theft. And he says we need a revolution to overthrow the government because the government cannot help but act in the interests of these murdering thieves, the industrial magnates and the bankers who really run the show. Um, and his personal story gives the, that perspective, I think, a, a little bit of weight. Um, you know, he was constantly being censored and having his speeches canceled. And FDR's government, which was, you know, relatively open-minded for the era, uh, not only shut down his book events, but had him deported from the United States when he would come here and try to talk. Um, so whether you find his argument compelling or not, it's important to understand that it was really popular at the time. The Coming Struggle for Power was a big bestseller, and it was published by a prestigious publishing house, even though he had trouble getting his newspapers and pamphlets published elsewhere. And when Keynes was putting together the general theory in the 1930s, uh, all of his ideas about public works and deficit spending seemed really naive, um, at least around Cambridge where, where Keynes worked. The book that people were reading and talking about was The Coming Struggle for Power. And I think it's basically, if you read the whole thing, it's, it's like a dressed up hybrid of Marx's Communist Manifesto and Lenin's Imperialism. Uh, it's much better written, I think, than either of those books. And so ordinary people, or at least ordinary college students, could get through it. So <laughs> it's a, a sort of pop marks. Uh, even though there's not a whole lot of new ideas there, um, they were. it was, a, it was a, one of a few texts that really helped disseminate the sort of Marxist message at the, the early 1930s. But Strachey ended up having a funny career, because after he was this hardline communist radical in the 1930s, he went to serve in the British Air Force for World War II so he could fight the fascists. 
Um, and after the war, became a very successful labor politician. And the Labor Party in Britain uh, in the early 20th century was openly socialist. And he eventually rose to be Secretary of State for War in the 1950s. So his own personal career kind of disproves the thesis to his most important book. Um, he, the government did not need to be overthrown violently in order for socialists to take power. Um, they were just elected and some of their most prominent members and thinkers became really top, uh, top officers and ministers in, in the new regime. So by 1960, he published a new book called Contemporary Capitalism, which is a, you know, a much tamer title than The Coming Struggle for Power. Um, and in it, he says, basically, the socialist leaders of tomorrow and today need to just adopt Keynesian economic techniques as part of their you know, socialist economic management toolkit, and uh, things will really work out okay. Um, so quite, quite a turn over the course of 30 years. Um, but of course, a lot had happened. You know, there'd been a war. And so what about John Maynard Keynes? Uh, if, like me, you encountered Keynes in an Econ 101 class the first time, you're probably familiar with all the stuff that he says about the effectiveness of public work spending and government budget deficits. Um, but that's not really how he made his career. He was a really famous man long before he was an important economic theorist. Uh, he made his career arguing essentially that the public debts accrued during World War I were unsustainable. Uh, his, his most famous book during his lifetime, even after he wrote the general theory, which kind of redefined macroeconomics, um, the most famous book when he died was still The Economic Consequences of the Peace, which was a treatise that he wrote basically condemning the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I. And he says in that book, what essentially what I just said, that the war debts and the reparations uh, that have been built up as a result of World War I are just never going to be repaid and they will, they will cripple the economic system uh, in Europe and also America if, if these debts are not written off. So the idea that you could go deeper into debt to, to deal with economic trouble was not something that had occurred to him yet. Um, it's important to understand that Keynes didn't see this debt relief agenda as a renunciation of capitalism. Um, he saw it as a precondition for sustaining it after a fairly unique catastrophe. Um, but it also meant that at the international conferences where leaders were deciding what to do about these debts and the economic system uh, that had, had you know, been bequeathed to the world by the war, um, at, at these conferences, he was literally siding with Lenin, um, arguing that you know, the Soviet war debts and the, the debts of, of the czar should be written off, in part because I think he thought it was unfair to task the new Soviet government with debts accrued by you know a monarch but also because he just didn't think i mean there was a famine that was happening in in russia in the 1920s and he didn't think that these debts were going to be paid um so when people didn't take his advice on debt relief he was forced to consider a bunch of other more creative methods by which to operate the economic engine of europe uh, and that's why we get the general theory if, if keynes had been attended to in 1919 or 1920 um, I don't think we ever would have seen Keynesian economics. We might have seen a, a system of economics that looks a lot like Keynesian economics, but a guy named John Maynard Keynes wouldn't have been the person uh, to become the sort of figurehead for it. Um, I think there are uh, some really important lessons to be gleaned from these three particular texts, even though none of them are like the big kind of epical texts, like, you know, Marx or Adam Smith, I think they tell us a lot about the types of debates that were happening around the turn of the 20th century by people of good faith and who were generally peaceful people who wanted to stop war. They, they had a, a, a shared set of, of objectives and they all believed that the economic system, however it was organized, was really key to preventing the really bad thing, which was war. So there was some sort of shared belief that an economic agenda done right could lead people to a more harmonious future. Now, how utopian they were in this outlook varied quite a bit, and they argued with each other a lot. But a lot of times they were arguing not over ends, but over means. The goal was generally to stop war. And the, the you know some other lessons to learn here too, which we can talk about, but this was not a system of ideas or an intellectual debate that was taking place 
as a sort of sterile scientific enterprise. Um, people weren't developing ideas seeking scientific principles that would hold true for economic management at all times and places. They were responding to a set of very serious and acute foreign policy crises, um, basically the collapse and mismanagement of the British Empire, um, and then subsequently uh, the emergence of, of the American Empire, the or the American hegemonic era, whatever you want to call it in the 20th century. Um, and I think that foreign policy element, the the impact that war had on, on economic ideas is generally misunderstood and overlooked when we look at econ textbooks that tell us about supply and demand and equilibrium and, and the like. I, I don't wanna denigrate economists for trying to come up with these, these things, but these ideas develop in a historical context, in a political context. Uh, and I think the most important figure uh, from these, these foreign policy crises um, is John Maynard Keynes, not just because he comes up with deficit spending, um, because that's an idea that is, becomes fairly popular over the course of the Great Depression. FDR is literally doing Keynesian economics before Keynes writes the general theory, but Keynes is himself a foreign policy figure. He makes a name for himself at the British Treasury when he's you know, basically running the finances for the British war machine in World War I. And then he's a really important diplomat for Britain in World War II. So economics comes to us through the lens of foreign policy in the 20th century. Um, I can talk about Keynes forever. Um, so I, I want to stop there and just see what you guys thought about these, these texts and, and what was interesting to you and, and like let you kind of guide the conversation from here. So do folks have questions? Can you see the class? I can see like a third of the class. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so I know Angle kind of wrote like six facts in his argument that we read the portion of. What I was wondering is when he said no other nation could gain any advantage by the conquest of the British colonies, is conquest inclusive of neo-colonial tactics, such as like, you know, obviously kind of forcing people's hands in trade, taking resources, control of like pharmaceutical industries, or was he solely talking about physical takeover or military takeover only? I think it's a really tough question for Angle himself. Uh, he's primarily concerned with physical confiscation of resources through violence. So sending in troops, bombing things, um, the idea is that the destruction associated with acts of actual war is counterproductive. But I, I think he also believes that acts of sort of economic bullying, uh, that I think it's fair to, just, to characterize what you're describing there as the sort of intimidation tactics. Um, he thought those were less useful than just trade. That if, you know, if I have something that's of value and you have something that's of value, let's exchange them and then we'll both have all of this stuff. Um, and there is, a, I think, an intuitive appeal to that kind of argument, but it's also kind of, um, kind of silly. I mean, it depends on what stuff you have and what stuff you want. Uh, <laughs> the value of other people's things um, depends in part on, on, you know, what your own needs are. Um, but, but yeah, he's, he's trying to come up with a theory that says everybody can get along and everybody can, everybody could basically get rich together. We don't have to, uh, we don't have to rely on theft and violence and categorize what you're talking about as theft, um, to, to see progress for, for humanity. Yeah. So I guess, like a kind of a part two to the question is what was his explanation for why certain countries did like the scramble for Africa? What would have, why would he say they did that? And does he believe that was the right approach? Yeah, he believed that people did that because they thought they could, they could, uh, they could enrich themselves through conquest. Um, and the point of his book was, was he believed to demonstrate 
that these efforts were irrational. And there's a pretty long history in liberal thought of, um, of, of describing colonialism as, as a sort of albatross around, around the necks of the imperialists, that once you acquire an empire or a colonial possession, um, that the costs of administration and, and maintaining these things um, is so great that it's, it's actually, it actually hurts the home country. It doesn't help the home country. Um, and that is a popular idea. I mean, Milton Friedman was still saying that in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, but of course, you know, the reason the British Empire, and it, it is true that the, you know, it's very expensive to maintain the, these empires and, and the British lost their empire because they weren't able to manage it. It was, it was too difficult. Um, but it's also the case that, you know, the reason people were doing this in Britain was because they wanted to acquire resources that would be, uh, would be valuable to at least certain constituencies back home. Um, you know, the British Empire in particular is, is kind of a confused ideological beast because it goes through different phases. Um, there's a Victorian phase of the British Empire where you have a lot of uh, what we would today call, I think, you know, progressive kind of do-gooders saying like, we need to go out there and help all these people who have been condemned to, you know, savagery by this unfortunate history that they've got. So if we go out there and show them the benefits of modern technology and trade and innovation and stuff and, and democracy too, um, then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll lift them out of the darkness. Uh, so that, that's, there, there is that strain of thought in British colonialism. Um, but, there's, but by the end of the 19th century, there's also just a much more brutal, acquisitive strain of thought, which is all about just taking other people's stuff. Um, and Engle doesn't feel like he needs to argue with the kind of utopian humanitarians. He thinks they're gonna be on his side against war, but he does think that he needs to argue against the more sort of brut brutal, you know, seize, uh, seize everybody else's possession school of thought and, and prove that you can't make yourself rich through, through theft and conquest. Go ahead. Um, so Engel talks about the size of a country having no relation to its wealth. Um, and you see that supported in some of the smaller European states prior to the First World War, like Belgium. Um, what advantages and disadvantages beyond that do you think economic size has on the nation's uh, wealth, ability to manage its wealth and grow? Oh, man, that's a tough question. Um, you know, the, the bigger the nation, I guess, the more uh, opportunities there are to acquire natural resources. You know, the foundation of wealth for most of human history is agriculture, but mining resources become more important as the industrial revolution takes off. Um, you know, Britain, Britain's industrial revolution requires the empire to happen. So uh, this tiny kind of semi-Arctic island up, uh, you know, near the North Pole does have quite a bit of coal, but it doesn't have very much gold, for instance, and Britain's on the gold standard um, for the, just about the entire 19th century. And where do they get the gold? Well, they get it from Australia and they get it from South Africa. Um, how do they get this gold in South Africa? Do they get it by just, you know, showing up and, and offering people like, uh, I don't know, bangers and mash? Like, no, they, they acquire these possessions through war and through uh, peace treaties with other nations um, and then through just outright colonial expansion. Um, so the size of the nation, uh, you know, it also creates, there are all sorts of network difficulties that get created the larger you get. I mean, you look at the United States today, um, we have a lot of people, but there are also large sections of the country where we don't have a lot of people. And how do you create a sort of common culture and common set of shared um, goals and ideals? Um, that, gets, that gets very difficult with, with size as well. Um, I, you know, it, to some extent, I think this is a peculiar preoccupation of angles. Like, I don't think we would talk about the size of the country today the same way he did, but he's also speaking at a time when like, he's not that far removed from a period of time when people are saying things like the climate will uh, determine the character of government in specific countries. So people believe that like Nordic countries are more disposed to democracy because they're cold. 
Um, they're just these weird things that we don't really think about anymore. Um, and I, I think size of the of the country is is sort of um, one of those kind of quirky variables that I wouldn't I wouldn't classify as like a major issue in international relations today. Yep, in the back, in the very back. Uh, just to bring it to something a little more contemporary, uh, I know you mentioned that you disagreed with Angle's ideas that he proposed about war and economics, but in the context of specifically like the Soviet Union and the United States in like 70s and 80s, what do you think are the economic factors that drew such different results between the Sino Afghan War that led to the dissolution and economic collapse of the Soviet Union versus the US war in Afghanistan? Uh, well, to be clear, I don't know a lot about the Soviet war you're discussing, so I, <laughs> I don't feel like I can I can opine on that. Um, I I think Engels Engels' ideas about war being economically counterproductive. I think the the most trouble the, the most difficult thing for him in that argument is that the war machine itself is an economic enterprise. So what you see in World War II, for instance, is not this like deep and terrible recession on both sides of the Atlantic, but like this huge economic boom. And you have this huge boom because all of these governments are spending so much money to create munitions and all the things that go into making war. Um, that that there's an enormous amount of wealth in society. The soldiers are getting paid. Everybody is employed. Um, wages are going through the roof in the United States at this period of time. Um, there's an enormous amount of production. It's just production for destruction. Um, and so long as the destruction doesn't take place on your soil, uh, it's it's a totally great way to create wealth. Um, it's a pretty grim way to create wealth, and it results in all sorts of terrible things. But um, Keynes observes this in World War One and says, well, why don't we just do that, but without all the destruction? I mean, why can't we have the state be turned towards, uh, be, be harnessed as an engine of economic growth and, uh, and, and poverty relief, essentially? Um, and that's those, that idea doesn't exist in the liberal tradition. Um, most of the liberal tradition in, you know, from Montesquieu to James Mill is about how to get, there's sort of a belief that if you remove the government from the occasion, from the equation, um, then the sort of meddling hands of the sovereigns, which are out there to, to sort of take the wealth away from everybody else, will allow more wealth to be out there to be distributed by the people. And it's it's not until Keynes that you get a really cogent argument for how the state itself can create prosperity. Thanks. I guess a question I would have is why did Keynes' idea of obviously focusing production of war during World War II work, but not work when Vietnam happened? Like what was the kind of difference between the two? Because I know they both tried to attempt it. Oh, I think it did work in Vietnam. I mean, um, jobs in the United States were plentiful during the, the Vietnam era. Uh, it, it's hard to disentangle Vietnam from the great society and all of the Johnson administration's you know, war on poverty efforts. Um, you know, a lot of the New Deal, we intuitively think of as this very, very, very large project because it was in the 1930s, but the New Deal as we understand it today is was you know, doubled or tripled by the great society and, under Johnson. Um, so, it, there are economists who specialize in, in distinguishing how much of the economic boom was uh, was was Vietnam and how much of it was um, was you know <laughs> stuff that was actually good, um, but uh, but you know I, I do think you know the, the war spending in Vietnam was a huge part of of the U.S. Um, economic situation in the 1960s and 1970s, and I think um, you know Eisenhower's caution that the military industrial complex is uh, is exerting undue influence over the political process. Um, you know, that's that's a, a really prescient point. Um, and the influence that they have is is in part economic, um, you know, through today, uh, one way that uh, ostensibly conservative regimes in the United States goose 
the economy is by spending a lot of money on the military. Um, and if you spend a lot of money on the military, I mean, you can complain about contractors siphoning off too much of the money or whatever. You're still having the government hand out a lot of money to people and, and increasing aggregate demand. Um, whether it would be wiser to increase aggregate demand by like building schools and hospitals instead of blowing them up. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious which one of those would be more productive. Um, but in the absence of no activity at all, blowing up uh, hospitals overseas, uh, you know, does increase demand at home. So does Keynes agree with, or if Keynes was like still writing today, would he agree how much the U.S. spends on military? Because obviously, I, if I remember the stat correctly, the U.S. military budget is equal to the next 15 countries underneath it, plus a billion. <laughs> So would he agree with the amount of spending the U.S. does? Oh, I, you know, I think it, it, with Keynes, it always depends on which Keynes you talk to because he changes his mind so many times. But on this point, he's pretty consistent, even though his own career is one in which he's constantly involved with war machines. Um, not constantly, but twice involved with the two largest war machines in the history of the world uh, up to that point. Um, he's he considers himself a pacifist. He calls himself a pacifist. And throughout World War I, um, while he's working at the British Treasury, his friends in Bloomsbury, these artists like you know Virginia Woolf and Lytton Strachey, Lytton Strachey, one of Keynes's best friends, I can't remember if this is in the first chapter or not, but um, he's the cousin of John Strachey, which is how I encountered that, uh, that text that you guys read um, when I was doing research for that book. But uh, his his friends all think that he's just a total hypocrite and, and traitor to their cause by being involved in, in the British Treasury. And I think Keynes, to some extent, feels that too. He's, his letters from this period of time are uh, really emotionally distraught about what's, what he's doing with his life. Um, so he's, <laughs> the, the really, uh, the most awful irony about his career is that he's somebody who develops all of his ideas in the service of peace and ending international conflict. And yet they're really only fully proven um, for history when they're deployed in war. Um, so like the, in, in Britain, at least, the, the success of the New Deal in America is, is, not, is not pursued. It's, it's really only until World War II that Britain starts spending money at the levels that, that Keynes wants. Um, but I think the the stuff that he does at the end of his life, you know, he is the, the financial architect of the British welfare state. He, um, he, he creates basically the National Health Service uh, and the, uh, the system of pensions in Britain, so like Social Security. Um, so he's, he's somebody who wants to direct resources to, to peaceful purposes, but just happened to be involved in the, the military apparatus of the, of the British government. I, I think he would be appalled by the world we live in today um, with how uh, just perpetual the, uh, the war machine has, has become. Um, he, he could turn a blind eye to that on British colonialism. Um, his vision of the British Empire before World War I was, was a very kind of rose-colored vision where we're bringing enlightenment and democracy and prosperity everywhere. And World War I sort of the thing that, that breaks him of that illusion. He says, ah, okay, actually we're really terrible and we're doing a lot of bad things and, and this is not good. So we, we've got to fix this. Um, and I think he would be really distraught to see the United States just kind of slipping in where the British, the, the British empire was at, uh, at the end of World War II. Yep. Who else? Really great question, um, and it's uh, boy, it's it's tough to come up with like a single a single cause here, because you have so much economic dysfunction after World War One, um, and it's possible I think to imagine the gold standard working out if it's managed more wisely in the interwar period, um, but it's not managed wisely and, <laughs> and it collapses. Um, he. There's a line from uh, his treatise on money from 1930 where he says, 
he says something to the effect that, you know, gold was maybe a good idea when it, it was launched and, but really it's only been going for about 50 years. And at this point it's become part of the, the phrase is the apparatus of conservatism. Um, so I think he, he eventually develops an ideological objection to gold and sees it just being used uh, as an instrument of, of um, the old order of, of social stratification and hierarchy uh, and of economic inequality. But before that, um, you know, the, the sort of magical aura attached to gold under the gold standard is, is, is like a progressive kind of ideal. Um, you know, the idea is that you know, governments aren't going to interfere in uh, the people's ability to, uh, to conduct trade, um, whether they want to conduct trade with people at home or abroad. And this, this kind of vision of free trade as an instrument of uh, progress and harmony is one that, that Keynes shares. And I think he just sees the dysfunction of the interwar years and says, well, I don't want to give up that ideal of you know, progress and harmony. Uh, you know, I still want to be drinking champagne at the opera in Paris and St. Petersburg, um, but I, I don't think this particular mechanism is a, is a good vehicle to get us there. Um, he, the, the, pro, the more like economic policy question would be that he, he sees the deflation of the 1920s and 1930s and says gold is clearly transmitting deflation around the world. It's, it's, it's taking problems in one country and just depositing them in another. So we have these terrible bank runs and bank failures. Um, there are several chapters of my book about this. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think that the deflationary economy of the 1920s and 1930s, he sees gold playing a, a really central role in that deflation. If you have a different gold standard where you don't have all that deflation, then um, I think he would have been he would have been okay with it. Um, but I, you know, there's also a reason why nobody's really picked gold back up since the 1930s. Um, it, it, it seems that most people agree with him about that. By the time he writes the general theory, he's referring to the gold standard as a barbarous relic. Yeah. Barbarous, Which does, right? barbarous. To, to some extent, yeah, to some extent is unfair too, because as he learns more of his history, he comes to realize that the gold standard is really only about 50 years old. It's not like it's this, it's not like gold is this like eternal currency for humanity that uh, it's, I think Alan Greenspan said that at some point after the financial crisis, he was, he was saying, you know, people are going to get into gold now that all these governments are spending so much money again, because it's had this power over the human imagination for 10,000 years. And I think you know, Keynes would have just laughed at him. Um, so connected to the question about the gold standard. So he says, Keynes says that uh, London's real financial might rested not on its holdings of relatively useless shiny metals, but on its international reputation of re reliability about the currencies uh, pound having international reputation and reliability. And in today's world, where like most of the countries have abandoned the gold standard and are on a floating exchange rate, does the currency still need to have a, like this same international reliability and uh, reputation for those countries to be able to spend like Keynes suggests in times of when nobody else is spending essentially. Yeah, a great question and, and, and also a difficult one. Um, I think to some extent the reliability yeah, is, 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 is essential. I mean, when you see episodes of hyperinflation, um, whether it's uh, Weimar Germany or Zimbabwe, uh, what you're seeing is not just like a radical increase in the quantity of money or something. You're seeing a collapse of faith in the government and, and people's belief that this government is going to be connected to this currency. Um, so there's, there's a political crisis happening, not just a sort of financial or quantitative crisis going on. Um, so I think that's, that's a, a pretty big part of things. But um, you know, remember also in 1919, Keynes is basically saying, hey, everybody needs to repudiate their debts. <laughs> and, and so let's, let's all be really unreliable. <laughs> and, and the history of the Bank of England is, is kind of funny. Uh, you know, this is a, the old hard money period uh, before the gold standard. Um, Britain was on a, a silver standard. So a pound sterling actually literally means like a pound of, of, of silver. Um, and uh, the, the like first loan that the Bank of England raises for Britain in 1694 
is at an interest rate of 8%. Um, and at the time, that's much higher than the, the interest rate that you could get on, on a private loan of, of people didn't really do private loans that large. I mean, this is like a 1.2 billion pound issue for uh, the, a war against France. Um, but the belief was that sovereigns were really irres irresponsible and that they would default on their debt. And a, a British king had had defaulted on debt like 70 years earlier. So because of this risk of default, um, lenders were going to demand a higher rate of interest. And as the British government raises more and more money, even though the national debt is getting crazier and crazier over the, the early 18th century, the interest rate on British debt is actually going down. So by like 1717, I think you're only paying 3%. On, on their debt. So at least in the early days of finance, um, there's clearly some connection between you know, the ability to repay and this sort of reliability stuff and um, the ability to borrow. Uh, I, for countries that control their own currencies today in uh, uh, the 21st century economy, um, you know, I think the political stability of the regime matters a lot more than um, the economic details of, of of repayment of debt, particularly for things like like currency stability. I mean, it, it may become difficult for countries to raise uh, to raise money on through the bond market, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to experience you know really serious bouts of inflation. Um, so I, I feel like I answered both yes and no, but I hope that wasn't a dodge. It makes sense. I think political stability is ways more than what economics can do in this situation so and they, they they you know they go hand in hand i mean there's a relationship between the two um but but they are distinct things yeah thank you well another question in the back <laughs> um, just with like connecting back to the gold standard i mean it's been out of fashion for quite a long time but do you think there's any inherent danger having our currency in our market based on just like the hearsay of one nation's currency? Or is that- what? Yeah, I mean, people in the 18th and 19th century certainly thought so. Um, I, so if you read the treatise on money, um, which you should not because it's a really awful long book, um, but <laughs> it's, it's even worse than the general theory. It's, so, it's so just so the writing is just so gross. And Keynes could be a beautiful writer when he wanted to. Um, uh, he has a section um, at the very beginning of the book where he's talking about what money is. And uh, I, I think one of um, Stephanie's professional colleagues, uh, Randy Ray, who is, is Randy still at UMKC, Stephanie? Yeah. Uh, Professor Kelton, I'm sorry. <laughs> Levy and Bard, Levy Institute and Bard College. Is it Levy? Okay. Um, he's, he highlighted this um, before. And, uh, and, and the passage basically says, uh, even if you have this other metal gold that is like the real money that you've stamped your, you know, your, your government currency on, it's the stamp that really matters. The thing that the government decides counts as money matters because the government decided that it counted it doesn't independently have value on its own. And so um, the idea that we all agree that gold is valuable um, comes from the fact that many governments have just said so. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a little bit dangerous to say that, um, that only this government say so is what is holding up this currency, but I also don't think there's really an alternative. I don't think the gold standard really fundamentally um, changes the equation. It just tells you that, like under under the high gold standard from 1871 to World War One, um, the the it's not really gold that is the thing. It's the international agreement that gold matters. So you have this sort of political sphere of influence, uh, much like you know the American sphere of influence after World War II or the Soviet sphere of influence after World War II, where all of these different uh, you know, nations decide that they're gonna, they're gonna operate according to this set of rules and, and this system. And it's that, that diplomatic element that matters, not the, you know, the actual physical thing. Yes. Um, how would Keynes feel about the petrodollar? 
Petro. Sorry, I couldn't. How would you feel about the petrodollar? Petrodollar. Petrodollar. Uh, probably bad. I, I don't know. What do you mean? <laughs> Uh, like how like U.S. dollars essentially back that oil because most transactions between countries that regard oil are paid for in dollars. So it's all like, would you say that sort of acts as a gold standard for the fast U.S. dollar? Uh, I don't think Keynes thinks that would think that our uh, our dollar is secretly like convertible to oil, um, and I don't think he'd think it was a good idea given how volatile oil prices are. Maybe we can say more about that in a, uh, in a future class. Um, Zach, I don't want to put you on the spot, but since you did write the whole book and you can do this stuff in your sleep, can you uh, can you talk a little bit about Keynes and Hayek? Because there's a bit of a void in this class where we leave off today and where we will start with Jamie. And I feel like that's kind of an important part of the conversation in intellectual history. And some of them have seen the Keynes and Hayek rap videos. Uh, and so I would just want you to talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about that relationship and its significance in terms of the way the debates were unfolding in that period. Sure. I spoke at a conference a few years ago that Professor Kelton invited me to, and I, I briefly like maligned the Keynes Hayek rap videos as really lame. and. Uh, and it was really embarrassing for me because uh, Professor Kelton had like just showed them like the previous day. <laughs> so Keynes and Hayek are are uh, a funny pair. Um, it, in a lot of ways, they, they they come from the same tradition. Hayek is a Viennese aristocrat. He is uh, an admirer of um, Emperor Franz Joseph and the uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire that he grows up in. Um, and Keynes is an admirer of the British Empire um, and is not quite an aristocrat, but part of the sort of upper crust of, of London and Cambridge life. Um, and they both revere this liberal tradition, this capital L liberal tradition that I, I mentioned earlier, and see themselves as sort of um, agents of its um, re-expression and rebirth after, after World War I. So the school of thought that Hayek founds is called neoliberalism, and Keynes in America becomes known as you know the the sort of like great liberal thinker of the of the twentieth century. Um, and by the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties, they're sort of viewed as opposites, as people who um, you know are one is a conservative and one is a liberal, or one's on the left and one's on the right. Um, but in 1913, 1933 even, it's, it's not obvious that they're political opposites. Um, they're really feuding over the meaning of this tradition and what's, what's important in it and what has to be discarded as a result of, of the experience of, of war and then the Great Depression. And by in the feud really starts in between them in, in 1930 when uh, Hayek reviews Keynes' treatise on money and, and says it's a really bad book. Uh, and in certain respects, he's right. Um, but Keynes responds by reviewing Hayek's book and says it's a really bad book. And uh, in just about every respect, I think Keynes is right about that too. Um, so th they're, they're coming up with a different set of economic policies to deal with the depression. And they believe that the right policy response to the depression will vindicate their vision of, of liberalism and the liberal tradition. And the amazing thing about the dispute in the 1930s is that nobody cares about it. Uh, it, it happens at Cambridge, Hayek comes down and Hayek's argument is, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but he basically says, in, to use Milton Friedman's term, um, you just have to let the bottom drop out of the world. And that is how you get past uh, a depression. You don't wanna do all of this fancy uh, monetary stimulus or fiscal stimulus. You don't want to have low interest rates or anything like that. Uh, you know, he's not just arguing against fiscal spending, he's arguing against the use of monetary policy to ease, uh, e ease conditions at the, the, the depths of a depression. Um, and Keynes says, you know, it's totally crazy. You have to do deficit spending. Um, in 1930 and 1932, when they're fighting over this stuff, um, Keynes's argument for why deficit spending is a good idea I don't think really adds up. Um, it's it's when he develops the general theory 
that that it starts to to add up. Um, but of course, in 1932 and 1933, governments are already in some places already starting to do the thing that Keynes wants to do. They just haven't come up with the reason why they're why they should be doing it. Um, but by 1944, um, Hayek writes a, a little treatise called The Road to Serfdom, where he puts these economic arguments into this broader political context and offers a different interpretation of the rise of fascism in, in Germany to the one that I think is more broadly accepted today and certainly was more broadly accepted at the time. Uh, Hayek says, fascism was not an enterprise of the right. It was a uh, it was a form of collectivism, and as such, it is better understood as a strain of socialism. So you can see in the Nazi party name, it's you know the the National Socialists. Um, and he says, essentially, all of history since the middle of the nineteenth century has been this steady encroachment of collectivism, beginning with Otto von Bismarck in Germany, starting to come up with poor relief programs in Germany. So once you start uh, interfering with property rights by taxing people and giving their money to poor people, you are on the road to serfdom. It's just, you know, you, you're not immediately over the cliff into, you know, Nazi butchery, but you're, you're walking that way. And each progressive step along this, this, you know, humanitarian path where you're trying to ease inequality and poverty is leading you closer and closer to butchery. Um, I think that story is basically impossible to square with what actually happened in, in Germany. Um, and so did Keynes. Um, but Keynes reviewed the road. To, he didn't review it for like a publication, but he read the road to serfdom um, on, on the boat from Britain to America on his way to the Bretton Woods conference. And he wrote Hayek a letter where he said, you know, you've said something really important here about the relationship between economic liberty and economic organization. Uh, and the, the progress of, of world peace and political stability. Um, but you've given us exactly the wrong answer for what should be done. Um, he says, I, I think we should have more government planning of the economy, not less. And if you don't get more planning, you're going to have more of this awful suffering that we saw in, in the interwar years, better known today as the Great Depression. Uh, and that's going to discredit the entire liberal tradition that you revere so greatly. Um, and that's basically the end of the argument until the 1970s. I mean, Hayek is very popular in the United States. The road to serfdom is, uh, is packaged into a, a sort of Reader's Digest pamphlet, which, which takes a nuanced, but I think not quite right argument about, um, about liberalism and, and makes it into basically a Herbert Hoover campaign speech. And this pamphlet version is super popular. Like industrial magnates in the United States are printing them and giving them to their workers uh, to try to convince them not to unionize and support progressive you know, uh, taxation and things like that. Um, but outside of like the, the super rich in the United States, Hayek's economics just aren't taken seriously at all. And in fact, when he wins the Nobel Prize in the 1970s, he's shocked because he doesn't believe that economists have taken his work seriously his his entire life uh, and even the nobel prize that he receives in in the 1970s is for like you know interdisciplinary work there's a, a particular term of art that the nobel committee uses when they when they celebrate him um, but in the 1970s it, it it sort of takes on this new aura because the neoliberal school of political thought that hayek has been so good at cultivating and developing um, rises to power and is uh, is running the show both in Britain and America. And so even though I think the kind of economics that people have pursued uh, under neoliberalism doesn't look a whole lot like the economic ideas that, um, that Hayek was putting forth in the 1930s, that clash in the 1930s becomes really important. And I think retrospectively, it, it really is important because they are both talking about the meaning of that liberal tradition the same way I think that John Strachey and Norman Engel were talking about that that liberal tradition and offering different interpretations of uh, of it through the lens of of the events in their time. Um, and I think the invention of this field of classical liberalism that um, that there's this you know centuries of thinkers who preferred you know small government and last day fair. Um, that's a historical interpretation that Hayek and his and his sort of ideological allies put forward. 
Um, and I think it's a really grave distortion and flattening of the diversity of thought in these liberal thinkers from the, uh, from the 18th and 19th centuries who sometimes favor laissez-faire and sometimes don't. Uh, you know, like John Stuart Mill, for instance, just identified as a socialist in the 18, 1850s. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a complex and, and nuanced debate, it, but because, because these two fight about it in the 1930s and because Hayek, Keynes wins at first, then Hayek wins later for about 50 years, um, we get a particularly narrow version of, um, of the history that they're both debating. And I think to some extent we lose sight of why they even debated. Thank you, that was great. Are there any other questions? Did you know I still have one? This is the one they enjoy the most. <laughs> so say what? Oh, you have one. Do you want to go? You want me to go first? No, you first. All right. Our graduate teaching assistant also has one. So Zach, right. tell us if you if you will. Are you a capitalist? Oof. Ah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's tough. Um, I didn't identify as one in high school and college. I was definitely like a left wing. Uh, I definitely called myself a socialist through my 20s, I think. Um, but I don't know how productive the labels are. You know, when you when you study Keynes, there's the sense in which Keynes is super conservative. He's trying to uphold so many elements of this this old order and he is trying to reform them. But, you know, he's arguing on behalf of the He's, he's like British imperial war manager, right? Um, that's stuff that like lefties don't like, including me. Um, but the, the there's there's this the, the sort of techniques that he comes up with to preserve capitalism. I, you know, certainly by the 1940s, they look an awful lot like the stuff that Bernie Sanders was talking about in his presidential campaigns. Um, certainly the creation of the, of the British welfare state. I mean, to some extent, that's even more extreme than, than, uh, than Bernie. I mean, Bernie is talking about, you know, maybe we could nationalize the health insurance system, but Keynes is out there just nationalizing the entire British medical system. Um, is Keynes a capitalist? You know, he thought so. Uh, I, 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 think, I think of myself as somebody who is opposed to high levels of income and wealth inequality. And I favor policies that lessen the gap between the rich and the poor, because I don't think you can have a sustainable political system with really, really wide levels of, of economic inequality. But even that argument for stability is kind of a conservative argument. It's an argument saying, I don't wanna see war and upheaval because I like having all these books and I like talking to all these nice college students. And that would be really unpleasant if I didn't get to do these kind of semi-elite things anymore. Uh, and so, I would like to see everybody be able to share in these things than to see my uh, participation in them jeopardized. Does that make me a capitalist or a socialist? I, I don't know. It's so, isn't it interesting how all of them, all our guests are answering this question? So Matt Forstatter was our first guest, Professor yeah. He just simply said, no. He said, I don't own the means of production. I'm not a capitalist. Okay, so it, it just speaks to how you define what a capitalist is, right? Mark Blythe said, yes, we are all capitalists because we all own, what did he say? We're all selling our data. We're all selling our data. And therefore we're all capitalists. <laughs> so these answers are really interesting to the class. This is our favorite uh, question to pose to our speakers because it teases out how different people in the various ways that people think of that word itself. You know, is it, I believe in free markets and therefore I think of, I'm a capitalist. Is it, I have a relationship to the ownership. Do I have employees that I can fire? I mean, there are so many different ways that people identify with that word. So um, my graduate teaching assistant, Jose has a question for you. Okay. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, well, I was, um, for so long, I have been very kind of enthusiastic about the New Deal, and I am very, very much interested in the historical context surrounding the New Deal. Yeah, um, I was thinking uh, about the political limits of the implementation of the New Deal, because as far as I understand, uh, FDR, uh, 
hadn't been able to pass the New Deal without the support of Southern segregationists at the time. And a huge portion of the population in the United States was excluded of all the benefits and the building of a somehow welfare state in, in this country. So, well, I, I wanted to ask you if you, if you can elaborate more, more about that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think to some extent the sort of progressive bona fides of the New Deal um, look better in retrospect than they did at the time uh, because they're, they're processed through the Johnson administration and the Great Society. So um, just about every program that, that, um, that FDR devises in the 1930s um, is opened up to a much broader swath of the public than it's uh, initially, uh, well, that some of the programs at least. Um, are, are available for. Um, I do think some of the, it's a tricky question to ask because, you know, I think, you know, there's all sorts of, if you, if you talk about race in the New Deal, I mean, stuff like the Japanese internment camps is pretty, pretty tough to stomach from a contemporary perspective. Um, but one of the issues that's often um, cited is social security being withheld from, uh, from black workers by having an exemption for agriculture. And the argument being that um, most black workers at the time are, are agricultural workers. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, um, but I think that argument is typically a little bit overstated. Um, the number of black workers who really were employed in agriculture by the 1930s is much lower than it was in the 19th century. Um, and I think the New Deals, uh, but, but, but nevertheless, you, you do have to, uh, uh, so the, 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 the process legislatively by which uh, agricultural workers were excluded was not obviously driven by Southern segregationists in particular. Um, but I do think you have to divide the New Deal constituencies um, at, at the Mason-Dixon line. The, the New Deal as it's pursued by politicians in the upper Midwest and in New York um, is, a, is different from the New Deal as it's implemented in the South. Um, so the defense of unions and, uh, and the Wagner Act and all the stuff that's done to, to build up the sort of manufacturing labor force, um, that stuff has a much more multiracial democracy element in Michigan than it does in Alabama. Um, so I don't think it's accurate to say that the New Deal is like fundamentally racist, but it is compromised by its administration, its administration through the states, and then also by the legislative process by which it comes to be. Um, but I also don't think, you know, I think the Great Society is is much more progressive uh, um, than the, than the New Deal in terms of who's included in these programs. But I also don't think you could have just dropped the Great Society on the country out of nowhere in 1965. And had everybody be like, okay, cool, let's let's do social security now and let's legalize labor unions. You know, for up until the New Deal, I mean, labor unions were constantly being targeted um, as by like antitrust suits and things like that. So the idea that jo joining a, a labor union was like an anti-competitive thing is something that's still around in, in the New Deal era. Um, it, it it creates a set of standards by which Americans can actually administer economic democracy. And in in the states in the north, I think they really, you really have to argue that they are administering economic democracy. Um, but again, the enforcement is, uh, is, is variable. There's an executive order in World War II that FDR is kind of bullied into signing by uh, civil rights activists that says, we're, we're not going to tolerate discri racial discrimination in the defense industry. And that's a big deal in the 1940s because in the war economy, like the defense industry is like everything, like 40% of GDP is the defense industry. Um, so if that's enforced, that's an enormous step for, uh, for civil rights. And it is enforced in the North, but it's not enforced in the South. Um, so you, know, you get these sort of piecemeal reforms. And I think the, you know, the political division of the country uh, that, the, the, the way that as a result of this, this like unequal division of, of the, uh, the fruits of manufacturing, the, the economic gains from the New Deal accumulate much more heavily in the North as well. So, uh, you know, there's a reason why the industrial powerhouse for the country ends up being in the upper Midwest. And it's not just because Henry Ford 
hails from there. It's because that's the best place it is to go and work. Uh, if you want to get a good job, that's where you're going to go. And, and that is where people go. Thank you very much. All well, done. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a million. Maybe we All right, can... thanks everybody. Okay. I said maybe we can get on the phone sometime soon. Yes, sure. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. take care. All right, Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.